call the occasion for which I wrote the paper that I'm going to read. I wrote it about six months ago for a late fall meeting in Taipei, in Taiwan, that was quite Asian international in orientation with Chinese, mainland Chinese, but also Taiwanese scholars present, Japanese colleagues, and some people from the West. The general topic was phenomenology, East and West, and there was this special angle to it that uh, also introduced a comparative perspective between ancient and modern. And I tried to place Kant as the main author that I work on in the midst of that controversy and perspective between East and West, between ancient and modern, and also tried to relate Kant somewhat to the disciplinary framework of the whole thing, this being phenomenology. As is evident from my academic biography and bibliography, I come to the topic and theme, phenomenology and Confucianism, with a European and North American philosophical education in modern Western thought, a specialization in classical German philosophy, especially Kant, but also with a long-standing intellectual interest in East Asia, especially China, and its fascinating blend of tradition and modernity in cultural, social, and political life. Accordingly, my contribution aims at linking the double topic of the conference then and the volume that now is in press, Phenomenology and Confucianism, with my own long-standing interests and ongoing investigations. First, I intend to address the phenomenological tradition with a reconsideration of the ancient distinction between phenomena and noumena. So phenomenology not as a modern, late 19th, 20th century movement, but as the latest development of an age-long conflict between phenomena and noumena. Then I will take up the comparative perspective of phenomenology East and West with a look at the major Western divide between antiquity and modernity, the ancients and the moderns, as they're also called, including in political uh, science and uh, philosophy. And finally, I propose to place the two chief representatives of traditional Eastern and modern Western philosophy, Confucius and Kant, into the previously developed framework of the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns, as it has also been called. Throughout, my special regard will be for issues of law and politics, which, on my assessment, can serve to bring out neatly and clearly the specific differences between ancient and modern, as well as between Eastern and Western ways of thinking. Section one, then, the phenomena and the noumena. Historically, Phenomenology arose out of reflected discontent with prejudicial and excessive theorizing in philosophy and related disciplines that threatened to manipulate and distort genuine research findings through rigidly fixed and largely unexamined prior notions. The programmatic call to the things themselves, in German, zu den Sachen selbst, uttered by Husserl at the founding of modern phenomenology, issued by the early Husserl, was meant to return philosophical work from sheer speculation and theoretical construction to the discipline engagement with facts and findings. Accordingly, phenomenology in its historical origin and intent was not so much a new method or novel technique for doing philosophy as a general reconsideration of how to do philosophy in the first place, as an open, observing and objective investigation of the things themselves, free of preliminary philosophical assumptions and attitudes. Given its fundamental, not to say metaphilosophical character, phenomenology as such is not committed to a particular position on the nature of these things themselves or the findings that form its object domain. Neither is phenomenology, by its very conception, a version of positivism or neo-positivism that would privilege certain givens, facts, or data over their subsequent mental or logical processing. Nor is phenomenology, in terms of its very idea, a variant of empiricism or neo-empiricism that would single out the immediate deliverances of sense and perception, such as sense data, as the only authentic basis for further cognitions. Phenomenology may be developed to coincide with those philosophical positions but a positivist or empiricist stand is not already implied by the general programmatic design of phenomenology as such. <clears throat> 
Strictly speaking, then, the things themselves appeal to in phenomenology's urkall are not something given or some set of data, but serve as a functional designation for any evidence available prior to the investment and application of philosophical theories of any kind. Accordingly, and dependent on the kind of phenomenology involved, the things themselves from which phenomenology takes this departure may be logical entities, mental items, or complexly structured cultural facts. In addition, the cognitive access to these things themselves, so variously defined, may be sensory or intellectual, or a mixture of the two, provided it is apt to grasp the things themselves in question, as they are, or supposed to be, independent of and prior to any assimilation and integration into procedures and processes of all kind. In a similar vein, phenomenology as such is indifferent to the doctrinal difference between realism and idealism in epistemology or metaphysics. The things themselves, to be grasped and preserved by phenomenology, may be empirical data. They may be logical items or facts of consciousness, depending on the further epistemological and ontological commitments adopted by a specific form of phenomenology. Husserl's own philosophical development attests to its openness, the openness of phenomenology for alternative approaches to its genuine object domain, the things themselves. The characteristic plurality of phenomenologically framed approaches to the things themselves even extends to the difference between static and stadial accounts of the things themselves. Generally speaking, phenomenology may ascertain and consider its primary objects, the things themselves, in their actual current presentment, or with regard to their temporal, quasi-temporal, structural development. From this distinction, together with its further modifications, results the major division into descriptive and genetic phenomenology. The distinction does not so much involve specifically different object domains as distinct approaches to the phenomena, with one focusing on their established constitution and the other on the very process of them acquiring such a constitution. A further feature that can convey the openness of phenomenology for philosophical positions of various kinds towards the things themselves concerns the status and function of the human mind, of subjectivity as it's sometimes called, in the constitution of the phenomena. Generally speaking, phenomenology involves the pointed disregard from features considered extraneous to the things themselves. Accordingly, phenomenology is crucially concerned with procedures designed to reduce or bracket factors foreign to the phenomena themselves, processes that have been called reduction or, in Greek, epoche. Such methodological elimination may concern objective factors, such as empirical instantiations disregarded in favor of an underlying general type, as in eidetic reduction in Huso, but the programmatic procedure may also involve the abstraction from particular psychological circumstances in an effort to ascertain generic structures of subjectivity, transcendental reduction. Finally, the range of entities targeted by phenomenological research may vary widely. The focus of phenomenology can lie on objects as such, things, in an effort to disclose their formal features and typical properties, formal ontology. Accordingly, alternatively, Phenomenology may target the content of consciousness, suitably cleared of contingent conditions and accidental attributes. In addition, the phenomenological pursuit of the generic forms and basic functions of subjectivity may either address the constitution of individual subjectivity, or it may concern the subjectivity involved in community or society, sometimes called intersubjectivity. In the latter case, a distinctly historical dimension may also enter into the phenomenology of intersubjectivity, as in Husserl's late work on what he called the life world. The extensive range and the broad spectrum of the forms and types of phenomenology covered by the generic designation phenomenology also affects the concept of phenomena in German phenomena, serving to classify the proper object domain of phenomenology. Unlike in Plato, and in the entire Platonic and Neoplatonic tradition, which relegated the phenomena to epistemically and ontologically secondary status compared to the primary reality of the forms or ideas. The phenomena of phenomenology are primary and authentic. Moreover, 
unlike the phenomena recognized in the natural sciences, such as in astronomy or physics, the phenomena of phenomenology are not the starting point for the crafting of hypotheses and the development of theories, but the objects of a philosophical account of the things themselves, that is to focus throughout on their manifest presentment. Moreover, the phenomena of phenomenology, numerous and diverse in type and token as they are, must be kept distinct from the specific sense of phenomenon, German Erscheinung, introduced by Kant into critical theoretical philosophy and taken over by Fichte, Schelling and Hegel to indicate the derivative status of an entire range of entities with regard to their underlying status and ground or principle. As in talk about, in Kant, the things in themselves or talk about the absolute or the idea in Schelling and Hegel. Just as the things themselves of phenomenology, which refer to a primary presentment, must not be confused with Kantian and post-Kantian things in themselves, which designate an inscrutable origin, so the phenomena of phenomenology, which convey reliable resources, must not be confused with the appearances of Kantian and post-Kantian transcendental idealism, which indicates, if not illusion, then at least semblance, to which they amount if their derivative status and mind-dependent character is overlooked and they are taken for the things themselves or in themselves. To be sure, Kant and the German idealists succeeding him recognize the genuine, though derived or dependent nature of apparential reality. Kant specifically links the very possibility of objective knowledge of experience and even science to its objects being appearances, qua objects in space and time. But Kant, as well as Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel succeeding him, aim at circumscribing the sphere of such knowledge and its objects in order to consider, to allow, or to admit other modes of cognition and other objects of cognition that exceed the confines of the appearance of things in favor of their superior, essentially supersensory being. The key concept that allows Kant and his successors to motivate and justify the advance from apparential reality to true, absolute reality is the noumenal in its distinction from the phenomenal. The nouns specifically correlated to the distinction phenomena and noumena refer in Greek-based academic Latin to the objects of the senses and the objects of the intellect, respectively. The purely Latin version of the division is sensibilia and intelligibilia, with the singular of the nouns being sensibile and intelligibile, respectively. In the metaphysical tradition, the terminology refers to the dual source of cognition in sense, sensus, and in the intellect, intellectus. Unlike the term phenomena, or phenomena in Greek, the equivalent term sensibility all by itself does not contain the classification of the entities in question as mere appearances, which instead requires a further argument from the sensory character of something to its merely phenomenal status. Such an argument typically is based on the platonic assumption of the epistemic and ontic inferiority of the senses, but may not be shared by subsequent authors. Kant first revives the ancient distinction between the phenomena and the noumena in his inaugural dissertation from 1770, written upon his assumption of the chair in logic and metaphysics at the University of Königsberg. As the work's title, originally in Latin, like the entire publication indicates, Kant distinguishes the world of sense, Latin mundus sensibilis, and the world of the intellect, Latin mundus intelligibilis, in terms of the correlated distinction between their respective modes of cognition and kinds of objects. Moreover, as also already indicated in the work's title, each object domain or world, along with its mode of cognition, comes with an exclusive set of rules and regulations covering the cognition of its objects and the objects of its cognition alike, the forms and principles in the title of the work. While the presentation of the form principles governing cognition by the intellect and the latter's intelligible objects remains sketchy in this early text of Kant's, the inaugural dissertation. The work's account of cognition through the senses with regard to sensible objects, 
anticipates the main features of the transcendental aesthetic from the critique of pure reason by more than a decade. This holds, among other things, for the introduction of intuition, Latin intuitus, as the cognitive vehicle characteristic of sense recognition, for the distinction between inner and outer sense, and for the identification of the forms of inner and outer sensible intuition with space and time, respectively. But most importantly, the work from 1770 already contains the critical assessment of the spatial-temporal objects of intuition as appearances, phenomena, which also serves and forms uh, the main conclusion regarding the cognitive deliverances of the senses, or of sensibility, in the later work, The Critique of Pure Reason, from 1781. Kant's eventual integration of the treatment of intuition, space, and time from the inaugural dissertation into The Critique of Pure Reason adds an important innovation, though, into the conception of appearances or phenomena and the relation between phenomena and noumena. Earlier accounts of the distinction between sense and understanding, including Kant's own previous assessment, had correlated the two kinds of cognition, one through the senses, the other through the intellect, with numerically distinct worlds, the sensible world and the intelligible world, respectively. By contrast, in the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant replaces the dualism of the sensible and the intelligible world with a one-world view according to which the specifically different types of cognition, namely sensory intuition and discursive concepts, refer to the same world, namely the world of experience with its spatial-temporally situated objects. For the critical Kant, intellectual forms and principles, that is, concepts in general and the pure concepts of the understanding, the category as he calls them, the categories as he calls them, referring to Aristotle in particular, while not originating in the senses, as classical empiricism would have it, still refer in a cognitively meaningful mode and a fully functional way to the world of sense and to this world only. More yet, none of the two basic kinds of cognition cognized by Kant, intuition and concepts, manages to obtain such fully functional cognitive reference to objects on its own and by itself alone. Only jointly with the exactly matching and mutually complementary specific contribution of each cognitive type can there be knowledge of objects at all. Put in terms of the very conception of phenomena and the overall project of phenomenology, Kant's botanically inspired account of the dual root and the single trunk of the tree, that is knowledge, amounts to an intellectualization of the appearances or in reverse consideration, to a noumenization of the phenomena. To be sure, Kant's introduction of intellectual or noumenal features, forms and functions, into the constitution of appearances qua objects in space and time, does not repeat the erroneous conflation and confusion of aesthetics and logic, which he himself charges Leibniz in the critique of pure reason to have succumbed. Unlike in Leibniz, for whom phenomena are but confusedly represented noumena, his technical term there is monads, <coughs> the Kant of the first critique recognizes a twofold and combined cognitive constitution of the appearances as objects that are at once determined with regard to their intuitive, phenomenal features and with regard to their conceptual, intellectual properties. Accordingly, phenomenology on a critical Kantian reading includes always also what I term term that doesn't occur in Kant though, noumenology, as opposed to phenomenology, or the study of the forms of thought that shape the cognition of objects as well as the objects of such cognition. Moreover, in addition to transferring the noumenal or intelligible forms and principles, which previously formed its own world each, into the intellectual core components of the phenomenal world or the world of sense, the Creek of Pure Reason continues to countenance a field for entities conceived as objects of the intellect alone and all by themselves, in formal and principal independence and complete separation from the objects of sense, with the latter reconceived as objects of sensory as well as intellectual determination, but still as phenomena throughout. To be sure, the noumena so preserved in Kant's critical philosophy are not possible objects of knowledge as they are in the metaphysical tradition, still effective in the early pre-critical Kant himself. Instead, the, in Kant's 
own expression, distinction of all objects in general into phenomena and noumena, undertaken in an entire chapter of its own in the first critique, and so titled, is based on the negativist, more precisely limitative conception of objects as not subject to the a priori forms of intuition, and space and time, and therefore as not phenomena and appearances, but noumena or beings of thought. In the first critique, and its companion piece, The Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, the delimiting concept, can call it in German Grenzbegriff, of such noumena, does not extend actual or possible knowledge from phenomena to noumena, but serves the essential function to prevent the erroneous confusion of the limited sphere of phenomena, limited to the conditions of space and time, from being taken for all there is. The conceptual space for noumena opened up but left unoccupied in Kant's critical theoretical philosophy in the first critique, receives its legitimate occupation only within the confines of Kant's critical practical philosophy, based on the supersensory concept or the idea of freedom as phenomenally warranted through the consciousness of unconditional moral obligation, categorical imperative. The domain of noumena under the rule of the moral law, so vindicated, is not a world of objects for an alternative, non-sensory or intellectual intuition though, as uncritical dogmatic thinking of the traditional kind would have it. Instead, the newly introduced world of reason, a world of practical or moral reason in Kant, in Kant's moral philosophy, is a cosmos occupied by persons as opposed to things and shaped by human willing and acting as opposed to mere psychophysical processes. Yet with all its independence and self-sufficiency under the practical guise of autonomy or self-legislation, the noumenal realm recognized by Kant's moral philosophy is not another alien world, detached from the world of sense. In particular, the two worlds or orders meet in the human being due to the latter's membership, citizenship, so to speak, in both worlds at once, and due to the double status this involves for the human being as a natural being, subject to the laws of nature, and as a rational being, subject to the laws of freedom. Moreover, the dual membership in both law-governed realms, nature and freedom, does not amount to a parallelism and pluralism or dualism of worlds. In a normative perspective, informed by the requirements of pure practical reason, the natural, phenomenal existence of the human being is to be ruled by the standards of that same being's supernatural, normal existence. Just as inversely, the facts and features of nature, including those pertaining to the nature of the human being, are to inform the specific articulation and the actual implementation of the laws and the rules of reason. The generically practical and specifically moral orientation of human existence introduces a second noumenal dimension into the phenomenal presentment of self and world. In addition to the features brought into the world of sense by the concepts, judgments, and further forms of prin and principles of theoretical cognition, and by means of the understanding, which shape the appearances of phenomena as such, there are, on Kant's account, in his moral philosophy, the further forms and principles governing practical cognition and the ensuing volition and action, which then are supposed to have immediate influence in the world of sense. The imposition of practical forms and norms on nature within and without the human being adds a layer of preternatural meaning and supersensory purpose to an otherwise merely mechanical world order. A phenomenology that recognizes with Kant the inherent preternatural dimension of the phenomenal world need not turn into noumenology in the sense of the spurious study of supposed spiritual beings, but a suitably enlarged and enriched phenomenology needs to be mindful of the cultural core of human worldly life and existence and its essentially historical and inherently practical dimension, which includes, in addition to morality and ethics in a narrow sense, the dural and political dimension of human life and its world in the life world in Husserl's terminology. It is with this reverential reference to the late Husserl that the investigation now can turn to the great divide in the life world between ancient and modern culture and life in general, and between ancient and modern political thought in particular. So section two, the ancients and the moderns.
The phenomenological tradition has made important and lasting contributions in the philosophy of time. This holds for Husserl's pioneering work on internal time consciousness, but also for more recent work on time in the context of human culture and its chief dimension, history. History in general, and human history in particular, are also prime examples for a broadened, noumenally enlarged conception of phenomenology that takes into account the made as much as the given and the social and the intersubjective as much as the individual and mental dimension open to and in need of phenomenological investigation. Social phenomenology, so to speak. The very term historia, used to designate both the discipline and its object of study, already indicates the more than factual dimension involved. The Greek term, historia, means research, and in its technical usage, originally refers to the researches, the historiae, undertaken by Herodotus, the father of history, as Cicero called him, into the great war of his time, the war between the Greeks and the Persians, Persian wars, which occurred in the early fifth century BC, and already in Herodotus, the term historia, in addition to referring to the researches undertaken, also designates the letters written results, history written, which may be more precisely rendered also as the writing of history, historiographia. The Latin language later develops a differential terminology that refers to the object of history writing as the things done, res geste, and to their recording and writing as history proper, historia rerum gestarum. Well, the research and writing of human history, which in the West commenced in classical Greece with Herodotus and Thucydides, and continued in Republican and Imperial Rome with Polybius, Livy, and Tacitus foremost, there came along a distinction, a distinct awareness of the phenomenon of change and development in human affairs, a form of development that exceeded the natural individual life cycle of generation, growth, decline, and death and that introduced formative as well as deformative processes at the supra-individual species level, so to speak. Not surprisingly, the efforts to grasp the dynamics of human history were for the longest time informed by the patterns of an individual animal's life cycle, including that of the human animal. In the process, forms of societal organization, especially those of civil society or the state, were likened to an animal, as in the talk about the body politic, their functioning was compared to the physiology of life and death, and their identity over time was traced to a prevailing character. With the introduction of Christianity in the Western world, the sense for history received a further articulation. The theological notions of fall and redemption replaced and overlaid the cyclical historical thinking that had prevailed in the pagan world with a linear, partly regressive, partly progressive understanding of human history. In addition, worldly history and world history came to be contrasted with life in another world that was to be anticipated and prepared for in the first fallen world in order to find its amended continuation in the reformed and redeemed order. Still for many centuries, in essence the Middle Ages, the Christian world proved a comparatively stable social and political order in which the twin powers of the church and the state ruled largely uncontested and with alleged divine authority. It was the beginning of modern history that the combined ecclesiastical and cultural upheavals of the Protestant Reformation and the Italian and Northern Renaissance that changed the nature of history in the West and according to the West in the most radical way, with repercussions worldwide and lasting through today. The new focus on the human being as such in his own dignity marked the beginning of an era intent on shaping and changing the world after human design, from the discovery, settlement, and occupation of remote lands through the crafting of new political orders to the development of science and technology. Still, for all its exploration and innovation, early modern thinking and living still remained under the influence of ancient times and previous traditions. This was true for the continued hold of religion on the people, and along with it, the hold of theology on philosophy. But it also held for the orientation of European culture toward classical antiquity. In fact, not a few of the early modern accomplishments were conceived along the lines of ancient precedent, from classical Greek sculpture and architecture inspiring Renaissance artists, through Attic drama inspiring the invention or reinvention of opera, to Hebrew history inspiring social schemes and political prog programs. <clears throat> 
a clear awareness of the great gulf that separated the ancient world, antiquity, and the modern world, modernity, came about only over the course of the 18th century with the advent of a philosophical account of history that extended human development from the comparatively confined time and space of ancient and modern Europe to the global stage and to a time frame comprising many millennia, addressed by terms such as world history or universal history. The precursor of these developments was Vico in Italy. Its chief proponents were Montesquieu in France and Herder in Germany. Further exponents of a specifically modern philosophy of world history comprised Kant, Herder's one-time teacher, Fichte, a forerunner of nationalism and socialism alike, and Hegel, in many ways a student of Montesquieu, along with Marx under the influence of Hegel. An important precedent and preparation for the radical re-evaluation of ancient and modern history in the Enlightenment and early 19th century authors just mentioned was a seemingly limited cultural debate in late 17th and early 18th century France over the respective merits of the arts in ancient and modern times, known as the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns, French the querelle des anciens et des modernes. The controversy concerned the value of imitation, imitation of the ancients, that is, in literature and the arts. In the debate, the ancients, meaning the defenders of the unsurpassed classical status of ancient arts and literature, to be emulated rather than amended or even supplanted by modern work, stood against the moderns, the latter term denoting the advocates of a genuinely modern mode of artistic and literary reproduction. The larger fallout of this initially more limited but eventually representative debate was an increasing awareness of the specific differences that separated the modern era, shaped by the Protestant Reformation, the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment, as well as burgeoning bourgeois commercial society from the ancient era and by extension from previous cultures and civilizations altogether, even outside of Europe. In particular, the increased perception and conception of universal history in a modern philosophical perspective infused history, its writing as much as its making, with the idea of ameliorative development over time or progress. Programmatically advocated by Condorcet, in the French Enlightenment and integrated into almost every philosophy of history from Herder and Kant through Hegel and Marx. The chief arena for the articulation of a philosophy of distinctly modern life was political philosophy largely construed, or the philosophical account of the codes, rules, and institutions, formal as well as informal, governing the intersecting but distinct spheres of juridical law, internal politics, <gasps> traditionally called police, and state politics or foreign affairs. To a larger extent, the philosophy of history that comes out of the second half of the 18th and the first half of the 19th century is a philosophy of political history, and a political such philosophy at that. By comparison, modern ethics, for a long time, seems much less innovative and more shaped by ancient traditions, chiefly Aristotle and the Stoics, at least until the moral sentimentalists in England and Scotland, such as Hutchison and Hume, and the moral deontolo deontologists in Germany, chiefly Kant and Fichte, introduce altogether new modes of ethical thinking based on human feeling and human willing, respectively, rather than on a preliminary conception of the supreme end of moral practice and pursuits the highest good in the old Aristotelian tradition. The innovative potential and progressive intent of political philosophy in early and high modernity in the West is not the le least due to the emerging political realities of an entire continent, Europe, emerging from the medieval feudal order into the modern world, a world marked by the sovereign territorial state, by religious pluralism, by the global spread of commerce and trade, and by the accelerated development of science and technology. With neither political science nor sociology or economics as distinct disciplines in existence yet, it fell onto philosophy and its ancient subdiscipline of political philosophy to address and assess the emergent forms and norms of civic society in the modern world and the life it afforded as much as entailed or even required. The chief tools of modern political philosophy were the twin traditions of natural law and the social contract, or rather the civil contract. The former instrument, natural law, while building on the ancient and medieval precedent of eternal divine rules for all human conduct, increasingly sought to disengage the founding and grounding of civil society from divine prescriptions 
in favor of conception of the modern state as based on rational principles that normatively restricted the given positive laws to objective, if no longer absolute, standards marked by justice and equity. The latter device, social contract, pact or compact, as it was also called, sought to transpose the civil law <coughs> device of freely entered contractual obligations into the sphere of political relations in public law thereby turning the citizen from a mere subject under someone else's rule into the, however fictitious, co-founder, if not co-governor, of civil society. A further formative factor for the theory and practice of a specifically modern polity was the conception of the state exercising, in essence, supreme political authority or sovereignty. The outward manifestation of this specifically modern development in political law which made the state the rightful regulator of civic life in all its aspects, was the emerging large and centrally organized European territorial state, along with its colonial empire, ruled by an absolute monarch. But on the new political philosophical account of state and society, the purpose behind the novel extreme empowerment of rulers was not the possession and exercise of absolute power for its own sake, as in the ancient tradition of despotism, a political phenomenon that had been the object of philosophical analysis and critique since Plato's political pathology of the tyrant and Tacitus' portrayal of Rome's decadent evil emperors. The true intent behind the almost omnipotent power of the state and its ruler, as epitomized in the mighty creature of Hobbes' political imagination, Leviathan, was the concern for lasting peace and sustained security in a modern social world marked by religious dissent and rivaling interests among its citizenry which made the modern state prone to religious war and civic strife. In fact, it could be argued that the point of absolute stately rule was not the abolition of liberty, but its preservation in a stately secured space intentionally left open by, for the personal lives of its citizens, in Hobbes' phrase, by the silence of the law. To be sure, the freedom or liberty so enabled as much as preserved by the Hobbesian state was, in essence, personal freedom in the leading of a life of one's own choosing, at most civic freedom under the protection of just laws, but not political freedom, which would have, considered, uh, would, would have consisted in effective participation in the governance of the state. The latter kind of freedom, political liberty, became the crying call for an altogether different direction of political theory and practice in early modern Europe in a move that resorted to ancient precedent for the citizens' participation in political rule. In particular, the theoretical critics and practical enemies of modern monarchical absolutism retrieved the classical Roman political tradition of republicanism that had made the state a matter of common concern, a res publica, and politics the pursuit of the common good, the bonum commune, the commonwealth. The chief characteristic imported from ancient Roman constitutional reality into the modern political world was the notion of the rule of law, of justly designed and equitably administered laws as opposed to the despotic nature of arbitrary laws. Moreover, modern republicanism came to tie the rule of law to the institutional and personal separation of the prime political powers, those of the giving of laws, legislative power, and those of carrying them out, executive power. But the importation of the ancient political philosophy of republicanism into modern political theory and practice proved problematic in several regards. The republican form of government seemed practical only in a comparatively small, commercially oriented political entity, such as ancient Venice, that was the survivors of an independent republic until the Napoleonic occupation, or the recently founded Dutch Free States. Also, republican rule typically involved not the entire citizenry in a democratic republic, but a select circle of social and civic distinction, aristocratic republic. Accordingly, even those in favor of Republican rule, arguably Montesquieu and certainly Rousseau, recognized the need to consider concrete circumstances in deciding on a suitable mode of government, thereby acknowledging the shaping influence of historical reality, past and present, on the norms and forms of life in the modern polity. Now to Kant and Confucius, an ancient and a modern author. The great gulf that separates ancient thinking and living from its modern counterpart especially manifest in the area of political thought and reality, weighs in all the more heavily when the thinkers compared do not share a historically continuous sphere and culturally related space, such as ancient Greece and modern Germany, but stem from drastically different places as well as times. 
This is the case with Kant and Confucius, to whose potential affinities with and remaining differences from each other, it is now time to turn. Transposed into the temporal framework of Western philosophy in general and Western political thought in particular, comparing and contrasting Kant and Confucius is like trying to link Kant and a 6th century BC pre-Socratic thinker, such as Thales of Miletus or Heraclitus of Ephesus. But the thinkers and historical note prior to the time of Socrates and his contemporaries, the Sophists, who Socrates and the Sophists first effectuated the ethical and political turn in Western philosophy, were, for the most part, natural scientists, physiologoi, as they were called. And accordingly, for a suitable comparison with Confucius and a meaningful contrast with Kant, it seems more appropriate to turn to another group of early Greek thinkers known for their practical orientation and their intent on giving prudent advice about human life rather than doctrinal instruction on the nature of things. Such would be the case with the so-called seven wise men from the late archaic age in Greek history. A prime candidate for a closer comparison with Confucius in view of the letter's further comparison with Kant would be the Athenian statesman Solon from about 638 to about 558 BC, who began the lengthy and eventual process, eventful process taught democratic rule in his native city-state with a set of constitutional and economic reforms known as Solon's laws, although not much more is known about them, that sought to enhance the cohesion and functionality of the Athenian polis. The new laws were in public display in Athens over hundreds of years, but their precise content remains a matter of scholarly debate. After finishing his legal reform work, Solon freely left Athens so that the Athenians might not force him to repeal the laws he had given them. Solon spent those 10 years traveling throughout the Mediterranean world, conferring extensively with political and religious leaders in the countries he visited. Solon's works, political as well as poetic, have survived only in fragmentary form and as quotations and later authors, including Plato and Aristotle, but also Herodotus and Plutarch. He figures prominently as a legendary lawgiver in medieval Arab and Christian literature and the arts. To Solon, such sage sayings are attributed as, call no man happy until he is dead. In giving advice, seek to help, not to please your friend. Or society is well governed when its people obey the magistrates and the magistrates obey the laws. On the face of it, several shared features strengthen the comparison of Confucius with Solon. In both cases, there is the practical orientation the political concern, the intent on moral and civic reform, the itinerant way of life, the sort of proximity to leaders and rulers, the giving of advice and admonition, the posthumous fame and reputation, and the much later recording of the sayings and teachings of each of them. Still important disanalogies remain that can be traced to the significant difference between the social civic culture of late archaic Greece and that of the spring and autumn period of ancient Chinese history chronologically contemporaneous. To begin with, Solon hailed from a leading Athenian family that traced its ancestry to the last recorded Athenian king and whose later descendants include Plato and the latter's uncle, the oligarch Critias, while Confucius' family background was much more modest. Moreover, Solon was actively involved in the commencing of that unique Athenian political experiment, popular rule, democratia, while well, Confucius lived, taught, and acted in the Prician context of feudal local principalities. Most importantly, Solon's legacy consisted in a lasting and effective local political and legal reform work with indirect long-term political repercussions throughout the Western world and even beyond. While well, Confucius lived on and continues to live on through his compiled recorded teachings, the Analects, and the diffusion and expansion of Confucian thought in the four books and the five classics. If already the comparison between Solon and Confucius as near contemporaries in different ancient worlds poses problems of compatibility and affinity between the two civico-political thinkers and actors, the comparison becomes even more difficult and even dangerous when extended to a more Western, to a modern Western thinker such as Kant, who is already sufficiently removed from an ancient author in his own Western tradition such as Solon whose very name, incidentally, nowhere occurs in the Kantian corpus. In the case of Kant, 
The political philosophical profile includes not only Solon's sympathies with vaguely democratic popular rule, but a principled regard for the freedom and equality, the equal freedom, in Kant's own phrase, that all full citizens of a state ought to enjoy. To be sure, Kant is not a supporter of the violent overthrow of monarchical or aristocratic regimes and explicitly denies a people or individual citizens a right, a legal right, to revolution, even against a despotic government. But while not supporting and endorsing the course of the French Revolution that had turned to regicide and political terror, he clearly supported the cause of the revolution, its call for freedom, equality, and brotherhood. For obtaining or at least approximating a political condition of civic freedom and civic equality, Kant favors and advocates on prudentially political as much as on principle legal grounds, not violent and sudden change, but incremental improvement, hence reform instead of revolution. In particular, Kant envisions in his political philosophy of history, civical, philosophical, and political progress to take place through reform from above, as he calls it, through enlightened rulers and their ministers and magistrates, insofar as the latter stand under the at least indirect influence of a prevailing public culture of free exchange on matters of science, politics, and religion, what Kant famously called the public use of reason. Moreover, Kant's advocacy of republicanism in political theory and practice is mitigated and limited to the institutional separation of legislative and executive power and to instituting and enacting such laws, and such laws only, that reflect the general interest of the people at the explicit exclusion of direct democratic rule. Still, even those limitations on Kant's republican political principles, which are typical of the contemporary dissociation of republicanism from democratism in the late 18th and beginning 19th century, do not really render Kant close and comparable in any substantial term to Confucius fusion of prudence and morality, of ethics and politics, in the letter's advice and teaching to followers and rulers. In particular, Kant follows modern political thinking about the call for separation of ethics and politics, even radicalizing the distinction by rendering it in principal terms. While not denying the foundation and limitation that juridical law and state politics receive from preto-positive general, even universal principles, such as natural law or the fictitious civil contract, Kant draws a clear distinction between the external laws issued by the political state in order to regulate actions possibly or actually affecting others for purposes of a peaceful and prosperous coexistence, on the one hand, and the inner laws of morality that prescribe and condition the principles or maxims from which and for the sake of which the willing of an action is to occur, categorical imperative, on the other hand. Accordingly, for Kant, the state's business of giving laws and policing their compliance is not to concern itself with matters of intent and character. By contrast, the unconditional obligation to will out of principle and for the right, essentially moral reasons, is the prerogative of ethical law, issued under the guise of the moral consciousness of the duties to be followed and to be followed, moreover, for their own sake. Moreover, in Kant, as in some of his predecessors and most of his successors, the disengagement of the political from the ethical also includes the separation of the political from the religious, which as such, and as long as it is civically innocuous, equally eludes state authority and government regulation. A further feature that separates Kant from Confucius, and by extension sets most of Western social political thinking apart from the Confucian tradition, is the categorical distinction between the social life forms of the family, understood as domestic sphere or household, Greek oikos, and the state, understood as the public sphere, Greek polis. On the Western model, as first formulated by Aristotle and radicalized in most modern political thought, the power relations that pertain in the political sphere, in addition to requiring the distinction between ruler and ruled, involve a condition of equality and reciprocity between the members of the fully functioning and politically active part <coughs> of the citizenry. While domestic relations in ancient and earlier modern times were marked by inequality in terms of natural and civic status. By contrast to the modern model, Confucian thought tends to assimilate the specifically political relation between ruler and ru subject to domestic and familial relations, such as those between husband and wife and between parents and children, in effect blurring the distinction between the personal and the civic. 
Still, despite the difference and divergence enumerated, there are two areas or aspects with regard to which a meaningful comparison between Kant and Confucius could be considered. One being in ethics, which in Confucius includes civico-social ethics, and the other at a more general, so to speak, meta-ethical as well as meta-political level. In both cases, Confucius and Kant's thoughts share certain key features, the basic breach between their philosophical projects and positions notwithstanding. The first point concerns the notion of reciprocity. For Kant, ethical relations between human beings ground in their essentially equal claim to the dignity of free practical beings ends in themselves in Kant's formulation. Accordingly, ethical relations for Kant are characterized by the requirement of reciprocity, which prohibits selfish self-exemption from the general rules of conduct and enjoins everyone to respect the equal humanity of everyone else. To the extent that Kant's formal conception of ethical willing as having to satisfy the requirement of possible universal application coincides with the golden rule of traditional ethics, Kantian morality meets and agrees with the Confucian yi, conveying reciprocity as well as righteousness. The latter concept also fits in with the Kantian contrast of juridical law and ethics and its counterpart in the rejection of ethical legalism in Confucian thought. The second aspect for a meaningful comparison between Kant and Confucius across the great divide between the ancient and the modern world concerns Kant's conception of right in its relation of functional equivalence to the role of ritual in Confucian ethical, civic, and political thought. While Kant agrees with most modern legal and political thinkers that the legal rights enjoyed by a human being qua citizen are entitlements for the claiming of which the bearer of those rights is deliberatively free or at liberty, Kant does not share the proto-liberal outlook that considers legal rights by liberties to consist entirely and essentially in permission and license. Instead, Kant regards rights as involving obligations and as being not only subjectively based qua rights possessed by persons, but also intersubjectively shaped and conditioned qua rights binding other persons who possess equal rights and vice versa. Accordingly, one person's right is another person's obligation to respect that right. Moreover, any right of someone involves the obligation of everyone else not to obstruct the enjoyment of that person's right through their countervailing conduct, provided the right in question is justly accorded and the persons in question stand in jurally ruled relations to each other, typically in those of sharing a civic or political community. The reciprocity of legal right and legal obligation, of freedom and duty in the jural sphere to be found in Kant's philosophy of right removes him from the standard image of a proto-liberal thinker, succeeding Locke and preceding Rawls, whose primary intent is to secure individual freedom. Instead, Kant emerges as a deontologist, also in the sphere of juridical law and principled politics. To be sure, Kant's insistence on legally rather than ethically based duties to others does not make him a civic republican in the classical and neoclassical humanist tradition of citizens' commitment to service and sacrifice for the state and for the common good. Instead, it makes him a legalist Republican that regards the rule of law not only as a means to a decent civic life, but as his necessary condition. For Kant, a justly constituted and administered civil society, a republic, constitutes an unconditional obligation, including the categorical imperative to pursue it, based on everyone's equal claim, or innate right, as Kant puts it, to freedom in the external exercise of their will. In this particular perspective, on the dutiful dimension of civic life, Kant, with his conception of individual rights involving mutual legal obligations, can be seen to converge with ancient approaches to safeguarding the cohesion and continuity of civic life, traditionally effectuated by customs, rituals, and other practices designed to ensure a member's adherence to a societal group through the enacted identification with its very functioning. If the role of the rights and of other formal and informal societal and civic practices in Confucius, or rather in Confucianism, is viewed in the same light, Kant's principal conception of rights as duties and Confucian rituals can be considered to agree, if not in method and doctrine, then at least in terms of their functionality and purposiveness for social, civic, and political life. Perhaps that is not much for a comparison between Confucius and Kant, but then again, we should 
as little expect to be able to find a Confucian Kant or a Kantian Confucius as there is to be found, upon closer inspection, a Scottish Kant or a Prussian Hume. Thank you very much. Thank you.